The Way My Mother Speaks by Caroline Duffy A personal poem Out of the six poems of Duffy's that we study, three of them are autobiographical, or at least semi-autobiographical. Each of the six poems has a very clear character or persona that the poem revolves around, and in three of those, the persona seems to be Duffy herself. She's writing about a personal experience. The Way My Mother Speaks is one of these three autobiographical poems and the other two are in Mrs Tilshire's class and originally. The three of these poems come from one of her more personal poetry collections, which is called The Other Country. And because of that, they have similar themes, the central ideas cross over, and the idea about transition is particularly important in all three poems. So they make a good set of poems to compare the similarities in. There are, of course, differences too. So the central concern of this poem is the transition between childhood and adulthood. There are other themes within the poem, but it's good to keep this in your mind before you read. So a little bit of background. In the poem, the narrator, as we said, likely Duffy herself, is sitting on a train, taking in the scenery and reflecting on this particular moment in her life. So she's on a journey. It's both literally a journey. She's going from one place to another and it's a metaphorical journey. As she looks out of the train window, she thinks about her mother and the relationship and how it has shaped the person she is today. And the way my mother speaks, the title immediately tells you about the connection between the mother and daughter and the importance of this connection. The narrator also thinks about being at the point in life where you leave your childhood behind and you really begin your adulthood and full independence in earnest. So it's about transition between childhood and adulthood. It's about the relationship between mother and daughter. And it's about the conflicting feelings that you can have at this moment in your life. So let's do a little bit of work before we actually see the poem and read the poem. Let's focus entirely on that central concern of transition between childhood and adulthood. I want you to think about why Duffy may have had conflicting feelings at this point in her life. I think it's important to bear in mind that Duffy had a relatively happy childhood and a good relationship with her mother. So if you were in her shoes, why might you have some negative feelings going off into adulthood? And why might you have some positive feelings? So if you could list a couple down um, on a piece of paper with a pen or wherever you're keeping your Duffy notes and don't move on to the next slide until you've listed some reasons why you might feel positively or negatively about this special moment in your life. Okay, hopefully you've made a few notes and you had some thoughts about why that process is both negatively and positively impacting someone. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's a huge moment in a person's life. Finally moving away from the childhood home and all the security and comfort that brings. So if you have a quick look at the negatives column here, Let's see if some of your thoughts line up with some of ours. So the likely negatives that you perhaps identified, you're bound to feel a bit of anxiety, anxiousness, okay, about having full responsibility for yourself. That in turn probably makes you feel a little bit vulnerable. After all, you've no safety net of a parent or guardian anymore. So if things go wrong, there's not necessarily somebody just around the corner to put it right for you. And finally, you might worry or have some concern about your lack of experience in the world 
Obviously, in adult life is a little bit more complex, whether that's sorting out finances, uh, cooking for yourself, or negotiating the complexity of adult relationships. However, on the counter to that, some of the positives you may be feeling at this point in your life, the thrill of striding out into the world yourself, that excitement and freedom you feel, you can finally sort of create your own identity and cut the apron strings with your parents. You can be independent of their thoughts, their beliefs, um, and be who you feel you want to be in the world. So obviously there's the anticipation of new adult experiences. They may, can, they may be offering you a fuller life than you had as a child. So if you have missed any of those things out, you might want to add them to your list at this point. So read the poem yourself and see if you can find some evidence of conflicting feelings. It's good to have your notebook or your paper and pen by your side on the next slide. After you've read the poem, we'll ask you to write down some evidence of those conflicting feelings. The poem will start along with a video of a train. The train noise is a little loud, you might want to turn it down. At this point we're just wanting you to try and get to grips with the central ideas in the poem. So you're going to identify at least four quotations and you're going to try and identify parts of the poem which show both those positive and negative feelings that our narrator Duffy is having at this moment in our life in regards to transitioning into adulthood. So have a look at the next slide. So, hopefully you noted down a few quotations or lines where you could see some conflicting feelings. There's an example on the slide in front of you. Under negative feelings, you may have evidenced the quote, under the shallows of my breath. If we have a little think about that, shallows of my breath, shallow breathing, Shallow breathing is that sort of short, rather sharp breathing as though you're struggling to get a breath. And it's normally suggestive of worry or panic, as though somebody's trying to calm themselves. And that certainly seems to suggest that at the beginning of our poem, our narrator, a Duffy, is feeling anxiety, worry and concern as she moves on to this important new step in life. Under positive feelings, you may have picked out this slow evening, browsing for the right sky, which appears in the second stanza. Perhaps you noted that the transferred epithet of slow evening, it's not really a slow evening, it's a slow train, so we have transferred that adjective from the train onto the evening, helps to give this idea of a relaxed and leisurely journey moving down the country. In that long time allows the narrator to fully reflect on this really important time in her life and adding browsing in there too adds to that sense that she's taken her time to consider her thoughts and needs, not, not rushing to conclusions. After all, Browsing suggests something that you do when you're not under the stress of time. So you may have evidenced some other things initially. One thing to note about this poem before you go on and find at least four other quotes or lines which you think show conflicting feelings of the narrator is that although Duffy uses simple language, there are a lot of layers to 
the poem and to the word choice. In fact, ambiguity is a part of this poem. If something is ambiguous, it has more than one meaning. If you look at the first quote again, under the shallows of my breath, and you see it in the context of everything else in stanza one, you could almost say that as positively. After all, another way of considering that is that Duffy is saying her mother's words quietly to herself. And there's something positive about that, that she's able to calm herself by quietly saying her mother's words. Also, this slow evening and browsing could also, consider, could also be considered negative. After all, the evening could seem slow as though it's dragging on and our narrator or Duffy is struggling to accept what's happening at this point in her life. She's almost drawn to wanting to stay in childhood, wanting to hold on to that safe and secure place. Browsing suggests perhaps even a sense of searching, trying to find what she needs or who she needs to be. The important thing to understand is whatever lines you pick out, you need to make sure you are analysing the language effectively so that you are justifying your point of view. Don't worry if you feel the quote lends itself to both positive and negative feelings. There are many in the poem which do. Now let's read the poem together. As we read, you may identify other examples of conflicting feelings. The way my mother speaks. I say her phrases to myself in my head or under the shallows of my breath, restful shapes moving. The day and ever, the day and ever. The train this slow evening goes down England, browsing for the right sky, too blue swapped for a cool grey. For miles, I have been saying, what like is it? The way I say things when I think. Nothing is silent. Nothing is not silent. What like is it? Only tonight. I am happy and sad, like a child who stood at the end of summer and dipped a net in a green erotic pond. The day and ever. The day and ever. I am homesick, free, in love with the way my mother speaks. Now that you've had the chance to see the poem, read the poem twice, and we've had a good think about the central concern, which is about transition and the conflicting feelings somebody might have about that, Let's do a more detailed analysis of the poem to focus on language techniques and other themes that are important. You will need a copy of the poem at this point, some pens, pencils, highlighters. We're going to annotate the poem in detail. We're also going to have some summary slides of each of the three stanzas just to clarify the important things to note. So in terms of stanza one, we have a short five line stanza which introduces the narrator's close relationship with her mother. This is a key theme to the poem. In terms of the type of poem, it's free verse. So there's no obvious fixed rhyme scheme, A, B, C, D, although there is half rhyme within the poem and there's no obvious fixed rhythm although again there are moments where rhythm is created. The style of the poem is certainly personal and reflective and from that point it certainly matches up with a number of the other poems of Duffy's that we look at. Stanza one immediately suggests a conflict within the narrator 
we call this internal conflict. It also focuses on the narrator's anxiety to begin with at leaving the safety and security of her mother's presence. As we move through the poem and she moves down England and through her journey, her feelings change. But stanza one is predominantly about anxiety. And finally, in the stanza, it's hinted that this particular moment in her life, this move, there's a finality to it, ever is repeated a couple of times. And it's just hinting that that transition into adulthood is permanent. You can't move backwards. Okay, so we're gonna annotate the poem. That's gonna help you get to grips with language features and techniques, language effects, and the relationship between specific lines and the poem as a whole. So make sure you have your poem in front of you and all your pens and pencils and highlighters for the next stage. Okay, this is stanza one. At the top here, you can see we have the title of the poem, The Way My Mother Speaks. Immediately that gives us the connection between Duffy and her mother, but also there's a link between language and identity. The idea of speaking, it's her words and the way she says them. And her mother is Scottish. And in at least one other of the poems we look at, Duffy is very interested in her identity and her links to how she feels Scottish as well as English. In the opening sentence, I say her phrases to myself in my head or under the shallows of my breath, we have I, her, myself, and my repeated twice. These are all personal pronouns, okay? And they fill the first lines of the poem. I mean, it's a very short opening stanza, and yet it's full of personal pronouns. And this helps to reinforce the deeply personal connection between mother and daughter. It also suggests she's missing her mother's comforting words and her mother's comforting ways. In the very first line, I say her phrases, there's a nice balance between the I and the her, and we get that sense of, of connection between these two. In line two, it sits there by itself, I say her phrases to myself in my head. In my head has got itself its own short line. And we do get the sense that the narrator's feeling some kind of isolation. I mean, she's deep in thought and she's reflecting, but there's nobody at the moment who can help her. She's very much in her own head trying to work through this thought and the difficult, uh, the anxiety she's feeling. The shallows of my breath we previously previously discussed. The word choice of shallows is interesting. Shallow breathing, as we've said, does suggest uh, is a symptom of anxiety. It could be read here to say that she is quietly, you know, talking to herself and quietly saying her mother's words. But shallows is a very specific word to choose with breath. And so it's likely to suggest anxiety too. Restful shapes moving. Now, this line is one of many that's a contradiction, or you could say contrast. Down here, we've given it the name paradox. A paradox is a sort of contrasting idea that does actually still make sense in some way. It's likely here we're talking about the train making the movement restful. So, as she goes down and everything is moving by, but she's feeling quite quiet and restful on the train. But this sense of contrast is a key feature throughout the poem, and definitely one to keep an eye on. So the confusion of these words, the contrast, they shouldn't really sit together, kind of echoes the confusion in her head and this uncertainty so uncertainty she has because she's once again leaving the comfort of her mother's presence. 
The final line of stanza one ends on the day and ever, the day and ever. It's repetition, okay, so it's a, <coughs> a sort of structural device, but it also creates rhythm. The day and ever, the day and ever. And that is like the steady rhythm of the train, okay? So it's also a Scots phrase, which just means like today and forever, always. So we get the sense of these are her mother's specific words that she would have spoken. We get that repetition of her trying to comfort herself by repeating these words. We get that link to the Scots identity and we get the rhythm of the train. It's all coming together now. I think the rhythm of the train is interesting and the fact that this is a journey, we get the sense that it's unstoppable. The motion is unstoppable. Just like this moment in our life, you can't go backwards. Everybody has to transition into adulthood. So it also suggests the narrator is um, trying to, to, to find this connection with her mother to comfort herself because this she knows this is a momentous part of her life. So that gives you a little bit of idea about some of the techniques, language and ideas in stanza one. If you don't like annotating the poem in this way, you could alternatively make notes on each stanza under headings. So for example, contradictory feelings, language techniques, structural devices, so short lines, uh, repetition, run on lines, that kind of thing, and symbolism, or alternative headings of your own. Now that we have looked at stanza one, let's focus in on developing our exam skills and looking at the types of questions you will be asked. So exam style questions. On the slide in front of you is an example question which uses the wording and phrasing of SQA higher questions for the Scottish text. It says, look at lines one to seven, that stands a one of this poem. By referring to at least two examples, analyse how the poet's use of language conveys the importance of the narrator's relationship with her mother, four marks. So, a couple of things to note. First of all, it always directs you to the lines to look at. In this case, it's the whole of stanza one, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it will ask you to look at lines which go from one stanza to the other. You might find it useful to mark down in your paper the actual lines you're supposed to be looking at, bracket round them or something like that. Also, in some of the questions, it will specify a number of examples. Here it says at least two examples. For a four mark question, the minimum you can write is two examples. Unlike close reading, it's quite hard in the Scottish text to pick up two marks for a single example. So it's quite important that you deal with three or four examples, if at all possible. If you are only listing two, make sure you aim for longer phrases, longer lines, where you might at least be dealing with more than one technique that you are analysing. And finally, it's important to actually note what the question is asking you to focus on. It's not simply about regurgitating the annotated notes that you have made on your poem. You have to think about how these relate to the focus of the question. And the focus of this question is the importance of the narrator's relationship with her mother and how that's brought out. So make sure your language explores that question focus. It is important to understand the questions just as it is important to understand the poem. Here's an example answer for question one. It's only giving us half of an answer really, it's worth two marks, but it does indicate how you should go about it. The pupil has chosen, I say her phrases to myself in my head, 
so the first lines of the poem. The poet uses lots of personal pronouns in the first two lines to emphasise the connection between mother and daughter. At higher, you don't gain any marks for identifying techniques by themselves. So at this point, our pupil has identified a useful technique, has linked it to the question, but has not gained any marks. The pupil must now analyse how personal pronouns show us this important relationship. I is immediately balanced with her to, to show the close bond the narrator has with her mother. One reflects the other. This is analysis and definitely worth one mark. The repetition of my also reinforces how much of her mother's words and her mother's language have become an integral part of how the narrator behaves and talks. Myself, my head. So this repetition conveys a sense of belonging. Again, this analysis of uh, the pronouns, further analysis of the pronouns would be worth one mark. So, so far, this answer is worth two out of four. So you do a little bit of work now. Pick out at least one other line or two other lines that you think uh, would be suitable for answering this question about how uh, words and techniques get across the importance of the narrator's relationship with her mother. Let's move on to analysing stanza two in detail. So here's the summary. It's a nine line stanza, so longer than stanza one, which develops the idea of the narrator feeling unsettled about her life changing. It suggests she's clinging to the comfort and nostalgia of the past and is uncertain how to shape her future. It also suggests the narrator feels isolated, but lost and unstable. So it's definitely developing the opening ideas and the themes that were presented to us in stanza one. If we have a look at how the stanza opens, the train this slow evening goes down England, browsing for the right sky. We have got a lot of long vowel sounds. The O in slow, the O in down, the O in gold, the O in browsing. And you can also hear that that is some internal rhyme going on there. Okay, the die and browsing the slow, the go, okay? So that helps to give this sense of things being particularly slow. And it could be interpreted as dragging, time dragging on, okay? So again, that implies the narrator is struggling with this change and she's uncomfortable with it, okay? It is possible to interpret that that it's leisurely as well. Goes down England, sits on a line by itself, a little bit like in my head, sat on the line by itself in stanza one. Putting it on that little short line does make it feel quite blunt. Goes down England, particularly since we've been told this is a slow language journey. Perhaps suggests that England feels a little bit like a foreign country and she seems a little bit disconnected, especially since we have this idea of the connection between the mother's Scottishness. Browsing here, browsing for the right sky. Well, yes, browsing perhaps suggests she takes her time, but it may also suggest this sense of searching. If you're browsing for something, you're normally searching and you're not quite sure even what you are searching for half the time. So perhaps she's searching for answers for the right place, the right way to feel. Um, this is very much a time of uncertainty in her life as she transitions from childhood to adulthood. Two blue swapped for a cool grey. Well, there's quite a lot going on in the final line here. We've got a bit of colour symbolism between the blue and the grey. So two blue, the sky here is symbolic. It represents her childhood 
and obviously blue skies are associated with uh, good days, fun times, and it does suggest a kind of nostalgia. Putting two in front of it does also suggest that she knows that she's idealising her childhood memories. So it was, you know, her memories are too perfect. Swapped for a cool grey. Swapped is an interesting word here. Swapped is something you would generally do quite quickly. You'll swap something in for something else. Um, and that does suggest this process has just suddenly happened or it seems to be happening a little fast for the narrator, for Duffy to process. Cool grey. Well, obviously, as she goes through down the journey down England, perhaps we are turning from day to night. So there's a sort of literal from blue to grey. But again, this is symbolic of adulthood. Grey, this lack of colour, this lack of warmth, certainly suggests her um, worry about the adult world ahead, which is not seeming appealing at this moment as she's thinking about it. And this line pretty much encapsulates uh, the whole idea of the contrasting language and the conflicting feelings that are a key feature of the poem. As the stanza moves on, this idea of time is developed. For miles, I have been saying, what like is it, the way I say things when I think? So we've had the slow, we've had the browsing, and now for miles I have been saying. Miles suggests the journey has been, you know, too long, but also it suggests that perhaps this is symbolic, you know, for such a long time in her life, her mother's presence has been part of her world and who she is, and her words uh, have stayed with her for all this length of time. What like is it? Again, we're back to Scottish dialect. What like is it just literally means what is it like? Um, but this is how her mother would have said things. So again, we've got that strong connection and comfort of her mother's Scottish voice. And it's a contrast with this idea of going down England as well. And again, it's about how Duffy holds both her English and Scottishness uh, inside of her at the same time. So it's again about language being bound up with identity and connection. The way I say things when I think reminds us that she's very much internalised her mother's way of thinking and her mother's way of moving through the world and it's become part of her. It's like a naturally part of her now. Then we come to this very contra contradictory line Nothing is silent, nothing is not silent. So we've got a lot going on here. We've got the repetition of nothing. Those, we've got that double negative in the second sentence. We've got two very short sentences in a row. So there's sort of structural devices going on. All of that really helps the line to jump out. And it's sometimes a little hard to get your head around. But this idea that even when there is noise, um, nothing is silent, but when there is no noise, and technically it's just very quiet on this train, there's still not really silence because in her head she still has her mother's voice, she still has her memories, and all of these things, all these worries going on in her head about her leaving her childhood behind. So again, this is about the sort of narrator's confusion and conflict but also the power of memory and the power of family and love and bonds, that you don't just forget your mother's voice or the influence she has in your life. It's kind of a part of who you are. What like is it? Again, we've got that Scottish dialect and the repetition of it helps to create that train rhythm again, but also the repetition helps the narrator Duffy to comfort herself um, and it helps to reinforce that idea of the connection with um, her mother, that bond. There's a lot of thin sharp vowels in this second half as well of the stanza and that does contrast with the sort of 
broad, long, slow vowels that we got at the beginning. And it's almost as if that anxiety and uncertainty is building again, the panic is building. And that needs to be resolved in the final stanza, and it will be. So let's focus again on our exam skills now that we have analysed the stanza in a bit of detail. So here is a different exam style question. Example number two. Look at lines 8 to 17, that is stanza two. Analyse how the poet uses language to convey the narrator's feelings of insecurity and or uncertainty. Four marks. Again, you are directed to the exact lines that you have to look at. This time, however, you're not asked for a specific number of examples, but the question is worth four marks, so you aim for at least two plus examples. Remember, if you're going to use, quote, two lines, try and analyse at least two different things within the line. You must make sure your analysis of a language this time is exploring the idea or ideas of insecurity or uncertainty. So that's got to be very clear. Have a go and you might want to use any of these quotes or all of these quotes to help. This slow evening goes down England. So think how that might relate to either insecurity or uncertainty. Browsing for the right sky to blue swapped for a cool grey for miles I have been saying. Be very careful when you complete your analysis, not just to pick out a word and say this shows insecurity or uncertainty. That's simply repeating the question. Make sure you fully analyse the technique and relate it in your own words to the idea of insecurity or uncertainty. So hopefully you had a little go at that exam style question. Let's move on to our final stanza, stanza three and our summary. So first of all, in this stanza, it reinforces the idea of this exceptional, exceptional moment in life where you transition from childhood to adulthood. The nostalgic tone continues here as she looks fondly back on her childhood innocence and her relationship with her mother. In fact, the bond between mother and daughter is once again made clear in the final line and we're really linking back right to the title, right to the start of the poem again, linking to the love of her mother's Scottish voice and her Scottish identity. The sense of a new and exciting adult world is also hinted at. So a little of that worry and anxiety uh, falls away in the final stanza and the poet or narrator Duffy allows herself to think of the good part of moving forward into adulthood. And by the end of the poem, their internal conflict of our narrator is resolved to a certain degree because she accepts that she can feel free and homesick at the same time and that that's okay. So let's look at the final stanza. Only tonight I am happy and sad like a child who stood at the end of summer and dipped a net in a green erotic pond. Only tonight. So what we're suggesting is this is a very specific moment. Only once will she have this big momentous transition into adulthood. It's a significant event and change in her life and she's marking it and she understands that. I am happy and sad. Here we have a very clear line which indicates that contradiction, that conflict within the narrator. It's quite simple, childlike language, I am happy and sad. And that's reflecting her internal conflict, that struggle between the basic pool of the child self and the adult self. Like a child who stood at the end of summer, 
So we've got a simile here, like a child who stood at the end of summer. And we've got some symbolism going on. Often the seasons are used symbolically to represent different parts of our life, with summer often reflected as the kind of childhood, uh, the heyday of our lives. At this point, uh, the season is ending and the beginning of autumn or the beginning of a new season. And it's symbolic of this idea of beginning of the end of one life and, and the beginning of a, a new life. And there's some nostalgia attached to that because of the whole image of the child and the pond, which is a sort of stereotypical image of childhood, child fishing in a pond, but it's been slightly altered by Duffy. But before we look at that, let's look at the word stood, who stood at the end of summer. You might stand at the end of something, but standing at the end of summer is an unusual idea. And it's though she's standing on the precipice of something, as though she's right on the brink of a new life, just waiting to kind of step into the next, the next phase. So looking at that stereotypical image of the child in the pond, she's dipping a net into a green erotic pond. So here Duffy uses word choice and symbolism of colour again to emphasise this uh, conflicting uh, idea or conflicting feelings. So dipped a net in it also is quite a tentative action. So again, reflecting that the narrator is sort of uncertain, that it's a big moment um, and there's that kind of worry about taking the next step. The green erotic pond, green here, obviously ponds can be green in colour, but it's symbolic of this idea of if you're green, you're normally new to something or inexperienced. And it's set against the adjective or erotic which is obviously used as a, it's a much more adult word. It's suggest, suggesting sexual experiences, sexual maturity ahead in an adult life. So the two together are contradictory, inexperienced and the sort of adult sexual experience. And again, it's just reinforcing the fact that we are leaving this one world behind and we're about to explore this uh, fuller world which the pond represents and you can't really see the, the bottom of this pond so it's all kind of unknown and there's many depths of this world ahead. Then we've got the day and ever, the day and ever. Again repetition, there's a structural, couple of structural devices. The day and ever is a run on line, okay, or in John Mont. And we've got the repetition of it. So again, mimicking that rhythm of the train, but at this point, it's reminding us that this whole process, this transition, is happening today and forever. So again, it's reminding us of how momentous the moment, the importance of this point in our life, but also the importance of our mother's influence. And finally, the poem ends positively. I am homesick. So she accepts that she loved her childhood and she is still nostalgic and is going to miss her mother and her mother's influence. I am homesick, but she's also free. Those two words shouldn't work together. They're a contrast and an oxymoron, putting them side by side, but it's a good explanation of her mixed feelings. And she leaves us with this thought. She is in love with the way her mother speaks. So it's this idea that she will carry her mother's influence, her mother's words around with her forever. And again, we have a run on line in love with the way. You don't stop there, that has to run on. And that's in Jean Mont. And it reinforces this connection between mother and daughter. They may be miles apart, but the connection will not be broken just by moving away and by moving into adulthood. Okay, so that's a full analysis of the poem. We're going to do a special language focus now, which is on symbolism. And it's likely something that you have met before in poetry, short stories or novels, plays in the past. So we've got a few tasks that we are going to complete. First of all, 
you should write down a clear explanation of what symbolism is. So you can Google it or you could watch the short video opposite. Um, but try and put a definition of symbolism into your own words in a way that you can easily understand. Secondly, we would like you to note down all the examples of symbolism that you can find in the poem. So there is symbolic use of colour and time. See if you can identify those lines, those examples. And finally, use the next slide to fully explore the meanings attached to each of the examples of symbolism. So, here's an analysis checklist. We would like you to take your example of symbolism. So on this slide, we have given you two blue as the symbol. And we would like you to do these three things. We would like you to write what the symbolic use of colour represents. So a symbol is a thing which is used to represent a larger, more abstract idea. What does the blue sky represent in this poem? Then we would like you to note down some ideas attached to the colour. So blue, blue skies, what would that normally represent? And then link it to the central ideas and themes of our poem. So below is an example, two blue, the colour of the sky represents the narrator's view of her childhood. So the blue skies represent her childhood. Ideas attached to blue skies? Well, blue skies are symbolic of fun, happiness, summers, perfect days. And a clear blue sky also is has links to the idea of brightness and clarity, seeing things clearly. However, as the narrator admits the sky is too blue, this does suggest that she understands she's idealising childhood. She's remembering it as unrealistically perfect. And that links to the idea that narrator is clinging on to childhood because she's just worried, afraid about the new adult stage in her life. So see if you can write a full analysis of the symbolic use of grey, the cool grey in the poem, and of the colour green in the phrase green erotic blue. Sorry, bond. There's also the symbolic use of time. Try and use our checklist to write a full analysis of the day and ever, only tonight and at the end of summer. And finally, once you have analysed the poem, annotated it, practised some exam questions and looked at symbolism in a little bit of detail, Let's think about the connections that this poem has to the poems you've already looked at and you will soon look at. You might find that you can make a few notes on each of these. So there are connections to be made between all of these ideas in this poem and the poems you've already studied. So you should be able to make connections between isolation, love, Transition, emotional conflict, internal conflict, time, identity, how characters cope with difficult circumstances, contrast and symbolisms. For example, in Mrs Midas, her character becomes increasingly isolated. In this poem, the narrator Duffy feels isolated because she's separated from her mother, but in Mrs Midas, that separation has been self-imposed, really, by her husband's poor decision-making. So it's about trying to understand how these ideas work in each of the poems and what similarities and differences there are from poem to poem. And finally, you may want to watch another example of analysing this poem. And if there's anything you've missed in your own notes, you can add it to them after watching this. By this point, you should have a very full understanding of The Way My Mother Speaks by Caroline Duffy.